Mr. President, when will you announce who your VP is? Not for a while. I mean, I have, we have so many great people in the Republican Party, but not for a while. Well, what criteria are you using to identify who your running mate is? Always it's got to be one thing. It's got to be who would be a good president. I mean, you always have to think that because, you know, in case of emergency, things happen, right? No matter who you are, things happen. It's got to be number one. Who is your running mate? Well, I have a lot of good people. We have a lot of really good people. So you haven't decided who it is? I have a lot of good ideas, but I haven't, and there's no reason so to do that So you haven't quickly. told that person, you're my person? I, I speak to everybody. I speak to everybody. You know, I called Tim Scott this, so because a lot of people like Tim Scott. I called him and I said, you're a much better candidate that, for me than you are for yourself. When I watched Tim, he was fine, he was good, but he was very low-key, etc., etc. I watched him in the last week, defending me and sticking up for me and fighting for me. I said, man, I said, you're a much better person for me than you are for yourself, because for himself he was low key. For me, he's been, he's been a real tiger. He's been incredible, and others have too. Uh, so maybe it's Tim Scott. Well, it could be, it could be a lot of people. But it was interesting. I was watching Tim. I've been watching, you know, for a while. I watched him campaign as a candidate, but I watched him over the last two weeks. Uh, as you know, he endorsed me fully. Endorsed me. Gave me a beautiful endorsement. And he has been really strong in terms of that. No, but that has nothing to do. I don't want anybody to take even any inference, but it's incredible. Uh, Christy Noem has been incredible fighting for me. She said I'd never run against him because I can't beat him. That was a very nice thing to say. What was it's the story that your team reached out to RFK Jr.? Did it's you? a false story, no. It's a false you story. never reached you know out what? to RFK Jr.? I like Jr. him a lot. Nope, never, never happened. The latest speculation is that maybe, maybe you would be the VP for Trump. Would you ever do that? Uh, I don't think that my marriage would survive it. I think he's right. <laughs> Just president. That's all you want. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Now, I want to go to vice president for a second. You know, I've written in the post that your short list ought to be Tom Cotton, Mike Gallagher, Joni Ernst, Mike Pompeo, Dan Sullivan, or Robert O'Brien, the latter of course, would bring you Latter-day Saint votes in Arizona and Nevada. Is some, are you going to name your vice president before the convention? Are you going to give us a list of people you're going to consider? And what do you make of my list? I think I'd make up a list. Some of those names are great. I agree. And maybe not every single one of them. You understand. But no, I think some of the names you have there are great. And we'll have somebody that's really going to be uh, very, very popular and very, very good. I know a lot of great people. We have a lot of great Republicans. Now, the biggest issue he faces is getting on the ballot in every single state. He's on the ballot in two states, New Hampshire and Utah. I had also asked him about something I'd heard President Trump had, had called him early on and asked him about being his VP. I asked if it were true. Take a look. If he asked you that today, what would your response be? I, I would not take that job. I don't, I'm flattered that President Trump would offer it to me, um, but it's not something that I'm interested in. Did he reach out or his uh, team? People from the team have reached out to me. The Trump campaign denies any such approach. Chris Lasavita, a senior advisor to the uh, former president, says, uh, just want to get this quote right, no one from the Trump campaign ever approached RFK Jr. or ever will. Now, clearly Mr. Kennedy has a different version of those events. But I would find it difficult to see Kennedy going into a Trump cabinet, though they do share some, uh, I suppose, common ground in terms of uh, skepticism of the U.S. aid to Ukraine, in terms of uh, skepticism about COVID vaccines, frankly. Those sort of issues provide some sliver of common ground. What was the it's story that your team reached out to RFK Jr.? Did it's you? a false story, no. It's a false you story. never reached you know out what? to RFK Jr.? I like Jr. him a lot. Nope, never, never happened. RFK is a radical liberal who happens to be anti-vax. That may be the one policy where, where he leans a little bit right. But he was for open borders for his entire life. He's against farmers. He was a radical environmentalist. Uh, he was super anti-gun. You know, he says he's changed, his, he's changed his mind. He's changed his mind on everything that he did for decades. Everything magically six months ago. I don't believe that. So, you know, he's a phenomenal alternative to Joe Biden as a Democrat, but he is a radical Democrat. 
again, the only place where he's historically ever differed from anything coming out of the Biden administration is that he's anti-vaccine. That's not enough. I think once people look at the record, it will speak for itself. So I think he's a great alternative as a Democrat. You know, maybe if people want to vote that way. But if you're going to vote for RFK, I see he's trying to get libertarians now. I'm like, again, he's anti-vax, but literally everything else would not be libertarian. But, you know, it, it, it's all part of the machine to try to stop Trump uh, as far as I'm concerned. And again, I think he's certainly a better viable option uh, you know, than Joe Biden for the Democrats. Uh, but he's no conservative. Let's not get ourselves. Let me ask you about your family. Many members of your family have been critical of your campaign. Prominent members put out a statement that said, quote, the decision of our brother Bobby to run as a third party candidate against Joe Biden is dangerous to our country. Bobby might share the same name as our father, but he does not share the same values, vision or judgment. Today's announcement is deeply saddening for us. We denounce his candidacy and believe it to be perilous for our country. It was signed by Rory Kennedy, Kerry Kennedy, Joseph P. Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. You know, I don't begrudge them those feelings. I think they're very scared that President Trump is going to get elected and they consider me a danger to the country and the republic because their assumption was that I would take more uh, votes away from President Biden from President Trump. So. Donald Trump has to win independence, and that's why the VP pick is so important. Having someone out there who can litigate these cases going on in a way that is credibly received by independents and suburban women. What qualities are you looking for in your vice presidential pick? Well, always the first quality has to be somebody that you think will be a good president, because if something should happen, you have to have somebody that's going to be a great president. A lot of people are talking about that gentleman right over there. And he's been, he's been so great. He's been such a great advocate. I, I have to say, I don't, this is in a very positive way, Tim Scott. He has been much better for me than he was for himself. I watched his campaign, <laughs> and he doesn't like talking about himself, but boy, does he talk about Trump. And I said, you know, I called him. I said, Tim, you're better for me than you were for yourself. But he's fantastic, and he's a fantastic person. Uh, so no, someone, who can, step in. That can, someone who can step into the role. Most importantly, you have to view that. The audience has uh, been asked who they think would be a good choice, and various names came up. Um, uh, one of them was, of course, Vivek Ramaswamy. No. He's made a big splash. Ron DeSantis, who's made in, making an appearance today in South Carolina, we just found out. Um, obviously, Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, and a, a big uh, presence here for Tulsi Gabbard. Um, very interesting. Um, are, and Christy Nome as well, I should say. Right. Are, are, are they all on your short list? Yeah, and when can, you, when can we expect that you will so announce your choice? The one thing that always surprises me is that the VP choice has absolutely no impact. It's whoever the president is. It just seems. Uh, I remember when Sarah Palin was actually picked and she did have a big up and then mm -hmm. uh, they just went after her at a level that nobody's seen. The Republicans themselves went after what they did. But you'll be a one term president because you've already served. Yeah. So you can only serve for one term, although they say you'll never leave office. I assume uh, yeah, that you'll do. never leave. There'll never be an ele another they say, election. Don't again. do it. He'll never leave. He's yeah. never going. Oh, these people. They um, are so for that reason, it is important so, who, you're, who you so pick. I think it's very important. But look, first is that, as we said, it has to you know, do with whoever is, you know, it's a very important position for that reason. Uh, you would like to get somebody that could help you from the voter standpoint. And honestly, all of those people are good. They're all good. They're all solid. And I always say I want people with common sense because there's so many things happening in this country that don't make sense. Who wants an open border? Who wants high interest rates? Who wants all electric vehicles? And they're fine, but you want to have choice. You want to go to combustion. You want to go to uh, the, any hybrid. I think the hybrid are much better from that standpoint. But you talk, we were talking about faucets. We're talking about, we should, we're talking about so much. It's all based on common sense. We want a strong military. We want choice in education. We want to have things that can really make our country great again. What we're doing with the open border is a disaster. Yeah. We are destroying our country. We're going to change that fast, and we're going to get your energy prices down. Mr. President, we'll thank you so much for this. Our leaders are censoring speech. Our political parties are stifling debate. They're, they're you know, trying to prevent candidates from running against a, a president by either suing them, you know, like Donald Trump, and I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. That's why I'm running against him. But
I, I, I don't think we should be a banana republic and remove candidates using the courts. Oh, Americans. I don't want to beat Donald Trump that way with half the country angry because they couldn't vote for a guy that they wanted. I don't want that resentment and that, that rancor to, to leave that. I don't want to win by, by cheating, by getting rid of somebody. What qualities are you looking for in your vice presidential pick? Well, always the first quality has to be somebody that you think will be a good president, because if something should happen, you have to have somebody that's going to be a great president. A lot of people are talking about that gentleman right over there. <laughs> and he's been, he's been so great. He's been such a great advocate. I, I have to say, I don't, this is in a very positive way. Tim Scott, he has been much better for me than he was for himself. I watched his campaign. <laughs> And he doesn't like talking about himself, but boy, does he talk about Trump. And I said, you know, I called him. I said, Tim, you're better for me than you were for yourself. But he's fantastic, and he's a fantastic person. Uh, so no, someone, I who want somebody that can someone who can step into the role. Most importantly, you have to view that. The audience has uh, been asked who they think would be a good choice, and various names came up. Um, uh, one of them was, of course, Vivek Ramaswamy. No. He's made a big splash. Ron DeSantis, who's made, making an appearance today in South Carolina, we just found out. Um, obviously, Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, and a, a big uh, presence here for Tulsi Gabbard. Um, very interesting. Um, are, and Christy Nome as well, I should say. Right. Are, are, are they all on your short list, and when can, you, when can we expect that you will so announce your choice? The one thing that always surprises me is that the VP choice has absolutely no impact. It's whoever the president is. It just seems. Uh, I remember when Sarah Palin was actually picked, and she did have a big up, and then mm. uh, they just went after her at a level that nobody's seen. The Republicans themselves went after what they did. But you'll be a one-term president because you've already served, yeah. so you can only serve for one term, although they yeah. say you'll never leave office, I assume. Uh, yeah, that, you'll just, never leave. There'll never be an ele another say, election don't again. don't do it. He'll never leave. He's yeah. never going. Oh, these people. They um, are so for that reason, it is important so, who, you're, who you so pick. So I think it's very important. But look, first is that, as we said, it has to you know, do with whoever is, you know, it's a very important position for that reason. Uh, you would like to get somebody that could help you from the voter standpoint. And honestly, all of those people are good. They're all good. They're all solid. And I always say I want people with common sense because there's so many things happening in this country that don't make sense. Who wants an open border? Who wants high interest rates? Who wants all electric vehicles? And they're fine, but you want to have choice. You want to go to combustion. You want to go to uh, the, any hybrid. I think the hybrid are much better from that standpoint. But you talk, we were talking about faucets. We're talking about, we're talking about so much. It's all based on common sense. We want a strong military. We want choice in education. We want to have things that can really make our country great again. What we're doing with the open border is a disaster. We are destroying our country. We're going to change that fast, and we're going to get your energy prices down. Mr. We'll President, thank you so much for this. Uh, RFK called me a couple weeks ago. He was coming to Minnesota, and he wanted to meet with me, and we were going to spend two days together so that I can get him off of this vaccine bullshit and start getting him to truly campaign on something that could win him the presidency, which ain't vaccines. No. And, and uh, anyway, though, uh, RFK and I were going to meet, and unfortunately he called me the day before and said he had a cancellation and a change of plans, so he didn't come to Minnesota yet. But, but let me ask you this. Did you guys ever read the book I wrote called Don't Start the Revolution Without Me? No, I haven't read that one. Well, I think you should. And the <laughs> okay, reason okay. you wait, and the reason you should is this. It was the book I wrote right after getting out of office and it were I'm traveling to my home off the grid in the Baja. And my wife and I both contributed to this book. And in the end of the book, I wrote all nonfiction until the last chapter. And this was a book I wrote back in 2004 mm -hmm. after leaving office. The last chapter I wrote fiction. You know what the last chapter was? 
<laughs> the last chat. Wait till you hear this. And this is 2004, nearly 20 years ago. The last chapter was I team up with RFK Jr. and we run for president. Only I'm the president, he's the VP, and I get assassinated. Interesting. Wow. And I wrote that yes. book 20 years ago. Going and, and I, Dick Russell, my co-writer, I said, Dick, I want to do something strange with this book. He goes, what do you want to do? I said, the last chapter, without telling nobody, I want to write completely fiction. Well, that last chapter, if I look at it today, might not be fiction now. <laughs> if he called you only, only the difference would be RFK would be on the top and I'd be the VP. If, he, if, if RFK offered you the VP spot, would you take it? I would give it serious consideration, certainly. I won't tell you right now yes or no, because it would it would depend on my personal life. Yeah, and that, and that, and that no, and that is the commitment I told you about moments yeah. ago. You know, would I want to commit myself at age 72 for one year of hell? Yes, <laughs> well, and then and then the worst part would be, and then possibly the worst part would be this. Winning. Winning. Yeah. And then I'd have to do it for four years. Uh, Let me explain something to you, Mr. Ventura. I'm um, going to explain. Uh, listen, this is very important. I I approached you after you won your governorship, and you totally haven't reciprocated. I asked you for your support. You wouldn't give it back to me. I don't appreciate that. But I'm going to offer you an opportunity of a lifetime. Do not go with RFK. He's a total freaking loser. I am offering you the VP spot on my ticket, and believe me, you're going to want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, you know, I don't think Donnie will be offering me that spot. I could I, I, so. I, no, I, 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 I did, I did a piece. He would definitely be shitting a brick if RFK made you his VP. Yeah. That well, I, I, I did a thing on Substack where I compared Trump to Manson. That's an interesting comparison. <laughs> he has that oh, kind of power. look at it. He has the, that kind of power. They're, they're mm -hmm. very, what he did on January 6th is almost identical to what Manson did on August 8th, 1969, sending his followers out, waiting for him to come back. And here's the scary part. The, the exact same number of deaths the first night. Mm. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Five people died. That's interesting. Very interesting. Oh, God. Yeah. The, 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 the comparisons are eerie. And I get it on Substack. Mm -hmm. Pull it up on Substack and read it. Like we like Kennedy's our greatest president of all time. Because mm. he stood up to the deep state and got dead. No, no, it's simpler. John Kennedy is the greatest president of all time because they allowed him to serve the least. Oh. <laughs> they killed him. They killed him before he had even served one term. Mm. Mm. Let me throw something to you. You're, you're hinting at me to go with the libertarians, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I have all the respect in the world for the libertarians, but I also have butted heads with them because mm. I remember the time I was governor and I was giving a speech on transportation and the libertarians started to boo me. Right. So, so I stopped my speech and I looked at them and I said, you don't think the government should be involved in transportation? They all said, no. And I looked at them and said, well, how'd you get here today? Yeah. <laughs> I said, you guys, I, I, I love your libertarian and liberty attitude, but in a civilized society, you st and if, if the society is civilized, you have to have government. Mm -hmm. I said, how could you not with transportation? Well, the biggest quality, the most important quality by far is how would they do as president? Because you really have to. That's the purpose. I mean, that's 95 percent of it, I would think. But uh, so that would be number one. But politically, you'd want somebody that's compatible. You also want somebody you can get along with. You want to be able to get along with a VP. You work with them. And uh, I think that's an important thing. But you really want to make sure that you pick somebody that uh, should it be necessary. And we hope it isn't. But they'll be a great president. Now, in terms of President Trump, what I did at the beginning of this race is I said, I am going to try to focus not on these culture war issues and the vitriol that keep us all apart, but I'm going to focus on the values that we all share in common. 
And one of the things that I really try hard not to do is to not criticize personally either President Trump or President Biden. And we're going to the lawsuits or the litigation or whether that's fair or that's fair. I just stay away from that. And I try to talk about the issues that they care about. And I think that that, you know, President Trump knows that I'm popular with his constituents, that I'm their second choice. And I don't think it's to his advantage to attack me. I'm sure he will at some point. But he also knows that I'm not going after him personally, that I, you know, that I do attack his policies. I, I do criticize him for his failures, particularly during COVID. He should not have shut down 3.3 million businesses with no scientific citation, with no public hearings, with no uh, environmental impact statements, none of the processes of democracy. Um, but what I've tried to do is really focus identify the values that we have in common. And what I found is there's a huge landscape that is so much bigger than things that Americans agree on. Everybody wants to protect veterans. Nobody likes that, you know, veterans' wives are now at food kitchen, soup kitchens. Everybody wants us to have the best education system in the country. Everybody wants to end the forever wars. Everybody wants to end the chronic disease epidemic. And now 60% of our kids now have chronic disease. When my uncle was president, it was 6%. Everybody wants to end this corrupt merger of state and corporate power that have turned our regulatory agencies into predators against the American public and sock puppets for the industries they're supposed to regulate. And there are so many of these issues. Everybody, look, if you want to talk about climate change, and that's all you, the only environmental issue you're going to talk about, you're going to have everybody fighting each other. If you talk about clean water, clean rivers, clean air, about stopping the, the, the destruction of the Appalachian Mountains, about the fact that 100% of our freshwater fish now have dangerous levels of mercury in them, that acid rain is destroying the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec. People don't like that. And, and there is no such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants our kids in houses. Everybody wants that. And what I'm trying to do is look at solutions and, to, you know, and find those issues. I found out that those landscapes are so much larger than the little culture war issues that are being used to keep us apart. You know, look, uh, people are saying it a hundred different ways, that they want somebody, they know what's wrong. They want somebody who can find ways to put it right. Next question. There's a billboard outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan, paid for by the DNC that says you are powered by Trump and MAGA. What's your response? My, uh, the, the DNC is saying because I... Because one of my PACs, which I have nothing to do with, legally can have nothing to do with, accepted money from a Republic, traditionally Republican donor, that somehow this should disqualify me from, uh, from people voting for me. Uh, we get money from Democrats, from Republicans and independents, and I'm proud that we're reaching across party lines, that we're trying to bridge the divide. President Biden says that he's trying to bridge the divide. But, but uh, this is just the opposite, is saying that, you know, there's a big difference, in, in, you know, that you're not really American if you're a Republican. And I just don't believe that. I think we ought to have presidential candidates that are receiving support across political divides. We need to bridge the divide and heal this. Country. You've chosen not to attack other candidates. Um, they've attacked you, the Democrats in particular. Why do you think they're doing that? Why do I think they're... I think that they don't. They have a candidate who doesn't want to debate. And so they have to try to win the election by litigating against people, by trying to get people off the ballot, by denying me ballot access, uh, by litigating against the other uh, candidates to get them disqualified. So we won't have to do democracy in our country. And, you know, I feel like we should be modeling democracy around the world. I don't want to win this election because I'm not a fan of President Trump's. I don't, I don't want to win this election by disqualifying him legally. I want the American people to decide who they want to be and have as president, and I want to beat him in fair and square on a level playing field. And I think it's distressing that the Democrats don't want to do that.
I'm not a fan of Donald Trump's, and that's why I'm running against him. Uh, but I think it's the, you know, I do, I, I've been outspoken about criticizing the Colorado decision and the Maine decisions because, you know, we have a democracy in this country. We don't have a banana republic, at least we're not supposed to. People ought to be able to vote for who they want to vote for. I don't want to beat Donald Trump. I believe that I can beat him in an election and that I can beat him in a debate. And I want it, but I want to do that fair and square. I don't want the playing fields slanted. I don't want to have an election where you get rid of a guy who, you know, a large percentage of the American public want as their leader, and you're going to leave those people feeling angry and frustrated and justifiably. So I've read the opinions. Um, I don't see how they can stand judicial, you know, Supreme Court scrutiny. I don't think you can get, he, Donald Trump has not been convicted of leading an insurrection. Maybe he did it, but you know, he hasn't been charged with it, he hasn't been convicted of it. So you can't really, I, I don't think it's fair, I don't think there's due process in punishing him for a crime that he was never convicted of. It's not, it's not the American way of doing things. And I think, um, and I think, as a strategy, that it actually hurts the, you know, the Democratic Party because I think it discredits them and it makes President Trump kind of into a, this mythological figure because people can see that this is not fair. So I want to beat President Trump, but I want to beat him fair and square in an election where everybody gets to vote for who they want to vote for. What do you think about Tim Mellon's donation to the PAC? He's a, a donor of Trump's, and in 2015 he wrote in his book uh, that black people were even more belligerent after the expansion of social programs in the 60s and 70s, and that in, the belligerent quote was a direct quote. And well, you know, I'm not, I am not legally allowed to talk to my PAC about any of these issues, any of the super PAC. And there are several super PACs that support my campaign. It would be against the law for me to tell a PAC to who or who they could not accept money from. And, you know, my opinion is that it's a good thing to have, a, to have uh, both Republicans and Democrats and independents giving to my PAC. I don't know anything about those comments and I can't verify them or validate them. But it would be illegal for me to pick up the phone and tell somebody you can't accept money from that pack. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I mean, I'm assuming, I don't know any more than you do, Tyreek. I read the polls, and it seems pretty uh, clear to me that my most likely opponents are going to be President Biden and President Trump. Um, my polling now it shows me with the highest favorability rating among all of them. So my favorability rating in the Gallup poll that came out yesterday was at 52. Uh, President Trump's at 42. President Biden's at 41. Uh, I beat both President Trump and President Biden among young people under 45 years of age, and I beat them in among independents, which is now the biggest political party. And so, and I still have 10 months to the election, uh, so I feel, you know, I feel very optimistic about where we're headed. President Trump's not going to bring this back. President Biden is not going to, you know, President Trump, I believe, wants to, you know, drain the swamp. I think he was sincere when he said that, but he appointed John Bolton to run the NSA. He's a swamp creature, like the template for swamp creatures. And, you know, Scott Gottlieb, who is Pfizer's business partner, to, to run FDA, and, you know, and, and Pfizer and Gottlieb did Operation Warp Speed, an $88 billion gift to Pfizer, and then went back to collect his, his paycheck on the Pfizer uh, board. So, um, President Biden is not going to unravel it. President Trump is not going to do it. And, you know, I think I'm the only candidate that knows how to do this and understands how badly we need to do this in this country if we're going to return the middle class. 
And if we're going to give our kids a chance, 